she uh, served as a director of the population and develop program in uh, Hampshire College. She is one of the author of the America Syndrome uh, Apocalypse War and uh, Our Call to the Greatness and the Feminist Classic Rep uh, Reproductive Rights and Wrongs. Uh, she is a Betsy Hartman. Uh, so I am uh, introducing you our second speaker. Uh, she is Anne Hendrickson. She is a senior policy analyst challenging population control as a collective power for reproductive uh, justice. She's also served as an assistant director of the population and development program of uh, Hampshire uh, College. She is a professional uh, published the author of papers such as feminist challenges to population control in area of climate changes or uh, threats and burdens. And uh, our last speaker is uh, Dr. Jurgen Sheffran, is a professor for integrative geography and the head of research group Climate Changes and Security at the Center for the Earth System Research and Sustainability at the University of Hamburg. Uh, he is also a collaborator at the European Institute for the Mediterranean, author of the War for the Environment, the Global Crisis as Cause of Conflict, Climate Changes, Security Risk, and several other pieces. Uh, these are uh, three uh, speakers in this conference. So I give the word to Bianca to do the question for, your, uh, for this conference. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Christy, for um, introducing our amazing speakers. Now, uh, we're going to let you know how this conference is going to um, look like. So we're going to uh, pose three questions to our speakers, and each speaker will have a determined amount of time to answer the question. Uh, so, um, the, uh, so for the speakers, just... Uh, for you to know that even uh, the questions uh, will be very straight to the point. So even if you uh, want to answer more, we'll um, ask you to stick to the time because we'll ask then other questions that will be related. So you'll be able to say more about it. And so, yeah, also I wanted to mention to the audience that um, you are free to ask your questions in the chat box and then we'll ask, uh, ask them to the speakers at the end. So that that way we can organize ourselves better. So uh, first of all, I will um, we'll go to the through the order um, that Christy has used. So we will start by Betsy, then we'll start that then we'll go through Anne, and then we'll go to Dr. Sheffron. We'll do that. And so the first question will be: According to your knowledge and experience. How do you position yourself in the midst of the academic controversy over the link between climate change and migration? As my colleague Felicia has just mentioned, there's controversy in the academic debate over this link. And so we will uh, we just wanted to ask you what do you think about it and why? So for this specific question, uh, you'll have five minutes more or less to answer. So we will start by you, Dr. Harman. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you so much to all the organizers. Um, it's really great to be with you today, um, and it, it's a great initiative. Um, well, it's hard to answer in five minutes, but um, I will just say briefly that I got into this issue because my um, previous research on environmental security sparked my concern about the narratives and articles emerging about the links between climate change, migration, and security particularly this notion of climate refugees threatening or potentially threatening Western borders. And I saw many of the problematic analyses in the environmental security field directly kind of projected on climate change. So kind of the narrative shifted to climate, but the, kind of the same old story. Um, and just as environmental security was deployed by different actors for different strategic reasons, so were and are notions of climate refugees, climate migration, and climate conflict. And I think, you know, as you all have said, we can't separate climate conflict and climate migration debates and, and research. Um, some of these actors would include aid agencies, um, international environment and security scholars who are onto another grand narrative, defense think tanks, United States and NATO militaries, um, kind of the worst case scenarios coming up around climate change, for example, in the Pentagon in 2003, 
this idea that there's gonna be this huge migration that threatens our borders. Politicians wanting to get more support for climate policy um, by using kind of national security high stakes language. Unfortunately, many people on the left also kind of buying this Kool-Aid, I would say. And then you have um, leaders in, for example, in Darfur and Syria, when this narrative came out about climate war and climate migration being, you know, very much part of these wars and causing these wars, it was a smokescreen against the real causes of the war. And of course, border security and um, uh, corporations um, standing to gain. Now, I position myself among the critics of those who posit a simplistic causality between climate change and migration. I do believe climate change is involved in migration. Um, I'm not saying, you know, and climate related migration, I believe, is a much better term than climate migration. Because migration is mediated by so many social, economic, and political factors, it's impossible to say in most instances, unless there's a real climate disaster, that migration is purely climate induced. Um, and um, I think we even have to be worried, a little concerned about climate related migration as a term, because um, it can privilege climate over other political, economic, social factors that are also involved in people's decisions to move. Or why do they have to move? Why isn't there an adapt adaptation plan in place, for example? Um, and migration is a very complicated phenomenon, as we all know. There's temporary versus permanent migration, national versus international. Most scholars of climate-related migration say migration is more likely to be within national borders than across due to climate-related events. And we also need serious research on the impact of climate adaptation and mitigation schemes on forced um, movements of people. So it's not they're not always good projects and how, how are local people affected in terms of those schemes. Um, and also we have to be careful of, um, you know, for example, in Bangladesh, people are called climate refugees in Southern Bangladesh. The sea levels are rising, that's a problem, but many people leaving are actually refugees from commercial shrimp um, uh, uh, programs which are financed by international banks and international agencies. So the climate kind of becomes a smokescreen again here too, to ignore the political economy of dislocation um, of land appropriation in a specific re region. And I'd just like to end by saying there's some really good work coming out now, I think, on kind of challenging the simplistic notions of climate migration and looking at the whole complex of factors and how they work together in specific locations. And I'd just like to guide you to a uh, UK report. Um, it's a government report. It's a systematic review, rapid evidence assessment of the in, on the impacts of climate change on migration patterns. And that's June 2021 by Jan Selby and Gabrielle Deuce, where they really go through the literature and look at all the arguments and come up with a much more sophisticated and nuanced um, uh, you know, uh, coverage of this climate and migration issue. Thank you. Wow, just in time. That was a spot on. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Farman. I will give the floor to uh, Mrs. Hendrickson. Thank you. And again thank, again, thank you for inviting me. And I'm really pleased to be part of this conversation. Um, like Betsy, I'm critical of oversimplistic correlations and arguments about climate change and migration. In, in particular, I challenge overpopulation thinking that, ten, that, can, that threads through these debates. And I'm particularly interested in taking apart the anti-immigrant lifeboat discourse, which blames so-called African, the so-called African demographic time bomb for overwhelming migration to Europe worsened by climate change. This stance draws from overpopulation or neo-Malthusian rhetoric of the past that blames population size and growth for economic, environmental, and social problems and advocates for interventions into fertility and migration rates to resolve those problems. And the lifeboat discourse is hyperbolic and dangerous. And lifeboat discourse offers an ideological interpretation of global population dynamics, which are changing rapidly, right? So there are, 
there is a growing and um, older population in global north po um, populations and a more youthful population in the global south which uh, who are which is contributing to um, continued global population growth and these dual trends of population aging and growth have contributed to this migration and security policy frame which depicts a weakened and waning global north unable to contain this explosion of overly fertile and um, overly vol volatile global south youth. Um, lifeboat discourse really draws from several economic and political science theories, and I think perhaps the most um, powerful of these in the migra climate migration and security debate is the youth bulge theory which builds on the environmental security frames which Betsy mentioned. The theory maintains that a large proportion of young people within a population um, corresponds with increased risk of political unrest. And the theory has a lot of flaws, and I'll just mention a few, that it um, tends to inaccurately analyze youth behaviors, particularly in varied um, African contexts. It perpetuates gendered and racialized stereotypes about black and brown violence and female fertility, and it often misreads Muslim youth organizing and politics. Um, and despite salient critiques, it's really a, a, a centerpiece of thinking in population and migration. And according to some theorists, when youth bold pressures build, safety so-called safety valve migration can relieve it and divert violence. And this is this is a rationale for interventionist international development and security politics aimed at containing youth in place. And recent, dat recent data challenges the assumption that population pressures are driving youth migration flows. There is not a significant association between the number of young people in the population and migration rates. And here I'm using research from the International Migration Institute at the Amsterdam Institute for Social Science Research that really shows that demographic trends do not play a direct role in migration and that data and pop, um, population and migration, quote, defies push-pull models and Malthusian explanation for migration, end quote. So they argue that further research is needed to understand the complex reasons, reasons for migration, and I think that is the theme throughout um, this complicating the overpopulation discourse is more research is needed and, and more reliable data to really understand this complicated picture. But ultimately, lifeboat discourse projects a dangerous us against them mentality, which narrowly frames contemporary population and migration trends as a battle of young against old, south against north, black against white, and in the context of increased climate insecurity and environmental scarcity. And the discourse systematically applies a valuation to populations that determines who should get a seat on this sort of hypothetical lifeboat. Thank you so much for such insights. I think this is uh, very interesting. And well, we will give the floor to Dr. Shefran to also contribute to this conversation. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this event. And I think it's uh, certainly addressing a very important subject. Um, I want to um, look at three different triangles. One is the triangle between um, climate change, violent conflict, and forced displacement. Um, and uh, of course, climate change is a problem for this planet. And it's mostly caused by um, the emissions of the northern rich countries over the last couple of centuries uh, since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, more and more countries are also increasing their emissions. And altogether, this um, goes beyond the um, carrying capacity of our planet. And it uh, has the implication that many people are suffering from the consequences of climate change. The second part of this triangle is violent conflict. And violent conflict has been very dramatic, of course, in history, particularly in the last century, 
with the two world wars, Cold War, the risk of nuclear war. And we are moving back into this situation of increasing violent conflict. As you see that we have a maximum of the number of violent conflicts on this planet, even more than during the Cold War times. And the third part of this triangle is um, uh, forced displacement, forced uh, uh, refugees. And uh, this is related to the other parts of the violent uh, conflict as well as climate change, but it's a very complex relationship. And uh, it's not an easy monocausal relationship. Um, as we had in the past century, um, a large number of uh, refugees as a consequence of violent conflict, uh, we may also see some impact of climate change on uh, migration. And this leads me to the second part, uh, second triangle, which is the different types of migration. Migration, in a sense, is normal in human history. It's nothing bad about uh, human migration if it's not forced, if it's not related to violence, and if it's uh, not uh, related to, to uh, forced displacement. Anything that forces people to migrate is not good. People must have the free choice to move according to their interest and in fulfillment of their interest in seeking opportunities. And uh, so we have to distinguish between the different types uh, of migration, whether it's forced displacement, free migration, or uh, uh, refugees. So this uh, distinction leads me to the Third, uh, third triangle that we have to look at. Uh, and this is uh, um, um, the question whether migration is seen uh, as part of the victimization discourse. Are the people victims of something? For instance, of forced uh, uh, violent conflict or of climate change, um, or whether the people are seen as a threat to somebody which is the discourse that is often seen in the global north, that they see migrants from the south as a threat. From, so this switches then from victims to threats. And the third part of this triangle is seeing migrants as part of the solution, as agents of change. Because of course, migration is a change. It's a change in location, but this can be also part of an opportunity, not uh, only part of the victimization discourse or the threat discourse as an opportunity discourse. And I think this is, uh, in each triangle, migration plays a role, but in very different types. And I think we should see people as migrants, um, people um, as opportunities, and people as uh, agents of change for the better. And uh, keep in mind that migrants connect, are connectors, are big connectors between regions. And this is a chance connecting because it means also cross-cultural communication that is possible as a result of migration. And in each triangle, we should uh, use the role of migration as an opportunity to uh, move the planet to the better and not to the worse. And this is my, my part of the contribution. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Shepherd. I think this... Um was really, really important to say. And it also has to do with actually our next question. So you really made a good bridge uh, for our next question, which is like, how can we, well, acknowledge that there's obviously a relationship, bigger or smaller than um, obviously you will, you will tell us experts, but there's a relationship between uh, climate change and some form of migration. So how can we acknowledge that uh, and at the same time, um, uh, not fall into this security threat narrative that, as Hendrickson was saying, is so detrimental and dangerous. How can we change the narrative of climate migration so that it isn't co-opted by closed borders, nations securing interventionist foreign policies in Western countries, etc.? You have three minutes uh, because then our last question will be a bit longer. So uh, we can start by Dr. Harman. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, how to change the narrative? Well, that's a huge question. And I think, you know, this discussion is a beginning, but um, would take much longer and it's going to take much longer. Um, I think 
continued research is important into uh, climate related migration um, in specific locations again. And I think we need to steer away from some of the narratives, for example, about pastoralists and, um, and uh, farmers and, you know, get a, look at location specific um, cases and good research. But in addition, I think we really need to um, change the narrative itself and look at um, other forms of climate conflict and climate related migration. Um, for example, now with the war in Ukraine, I've been thinking a lot about the role of the fossil fuel economy and our reliance on fossil fuels in fueling that war, in um, fueling Russian militarism and militarism in many other countries, um, for example, Saudi Arabia and in, in Yemen, um, and of course, U.S. Uh, aggression in the Middle East um, over the past decades. Um, and of course, militaries themselves are um, very large consumers of fossil fuels. The uh, US um, military is the single largest um, consumer of transportation fuel in the world. And um, with now, and with the, we're seeing a vicious cycle emerging now, I think, or it's been emerging for a long time, but the Ukraine war really brings it into sharp relief. War is now pushing climate policy onto the back burner, at least in the United States. And um, we're going to see a huge buildup of the military industrial complex, I think, in many countries, uh, NATO, US, um, in the region. And um, this is going to have profound um, uh, ramifications for the climate movement and for the ability to get you know, international cooperation on climate. Um, it will also um, probably, unfortunately, beef up the kind of border control um, industry as well. So I think we need to change, I would like to see a fundamental change to the narrative where we look much more at fossil fuel interests, fossil fuel economies, fossil fuel politics, and their role in um, you know, really blocking progressive change on climate change and creating um, war and conflict. Let's you know, put, a, put a real focus on war. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I think that this approach and linkage with uh, what's happening right now, it's also very valuable. Uh, I will give the floor to Mrs. Hendrickson. Thank you. Um, well, my first recommendation would be to challenge these racialized age frames that I've been laying out and really thinking about the, the fear it perpetuates and the, the idea of an invader. So how do we interrupt the invader and the weak North assumptions. And one of my um, suggestions is to do what you're doing. <laughs> so to amplify critical takes from young scholars, activists, and movements, and to particularly those in, in African contexts, given the conversation um, around the, the, the peril and promise of African youth right now. Um, and I think like that I'm interested in likewise, how do you interrupt this narrative of weak and unproductive elderly? And how can you do that in tandem, right? So I think one of the problems with our analyses is that we either focus on youth or on aging and that um, the preoccupation with youth in international development circles sort of um, makes them exceptional. But how do you then develop an analysis that connects and recognizes the ways in which our lives are overlap and sort of desegregates our thinking um, about age, but also race and sort of is, is asking the research questions that actively break down borders and boundaries, and I think is particularly promising. And um, I would also say as we fight sort of uh, the criminalization and surveillance mindset around migrant youth, um, likewise take on the criminalization of aid workers who support migrants. And then strengthen the fight against fascism always. And I'm um, gonna be, talk about that a bit more, but um, maybe we can also discuss in our, in our discussion. Thanks. Thank you. And last but not least, Dr. Sheffern. Yes, um, I, I, I can continue what uh, Anne and Betsy have said. And uh, my point is the shifting of thinking. Um, we had a shifting of thinking at the end of the Cold War. 
and uh, that's moving away from all these negative nexuses that we are seeing all around the world, from the vicious cycles to the virtuous cycles. And uh, um, that is important to convert our thinking, not only thinking about all these compounding risks, the, the negative tickling points, uh, risk multipliers, the cycle of violences that are, we are all preoccupied with, towards positive nexuses, okay? From the negative to the positive nexus, this is the main challenge. And uh, a positive nexus means we are also using the synergies of solutions. Um, and uh, we are still have to think about starting what one solution like sustainability can have cause positive contribution in terms of creating peace. So this is one of the positive linkages between sustainability and peace. Sustainable peace is one of these. But also migration can be part of this, of course. Migration itself can be part of the, the positive solutions um, in terms of uh, um, uh, joint governance. Governance, governments and civil society can work together. So another positive linkage that we can think about or multi-scale connections, the global and the local. Another positive linkage and synergies that we can think about how can local solutions trigger global solutions and vice versa. And uh, so we develop also theoretical concepts and practical concepts, how they can benefit each other. Another positive linkage that we can develop and uh, um, the linkages across social networks and capacity building and participation of people as well as government. So there are many positive linkages and synergies that we can develop that are currently negative, move them to the positive direction. Okay, um, all these synergies and linkages is shifting transformation towards a positive linkage, climate peace nexus into other than a climate threat nexus. Okay, and this is uh, a lot more we can develop uh, yeah, to strengthen these linkages. This is part of the shifting of thinking. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, our last question is also very related to this one, uh, but this goes a little bit more in detail and therefore we'll have more time to discuss it, which is like on a broader level, what can we do specifically to change the way climate amplified migration is tackled in order to generally help populations instead of serving a mere security political strategy and agenda. So here we're talking about concrete policies to tackle um, not only uh, climate induced migration, but also uh, to tackle the narrative and to generally help people. So it can be measures, uh, more general measures, but also if you have specific measures that you think we should, as an organization, try to amplify to governments around the world, we'd also be very interested in listening to that. So we'll start by Dr. Herman. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry, uh, it's seven minutes you have, if you want less, more, but we have more yeah. or less than a minute, so feel free, sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, well, thank you for remarks of my fellow panelists too, and um, I, I like the, the positive um, emphasis. But I'll, uh, as is my um, want, I'll start off with um, just a way I think we need to also critically look at how climate migration narratives are presently deployed to build up the border security complex. And very specifically, I would love to see more research on which corporations are benefiting benefiting, which defense agencies are pushing this. So we really start to understand in order to do the positive work, I think we have to um, also better understand the kind of political economy of the kind of threat production and the border control industry that goes along with it. Um, and, and important, like Jürgen said, the, the importance of destigmatizing migration and my, migrants in general, and as Anne said also, and to challenge anti-immigrant political movements and the rise of the far right, both in Europe and the United States, and the use of immigration and increasingly connecting immigration and climate change in some eco-fascist quarters is extremely important to challenge that. And that's um, where progressive movements and peace movements and climate movements can do that. Um, I think we need to challenge ideas of who are the good versus the bad migrants 
and how easily some groups are turned into climate refugees. For example, Syrian war refugees during the 2015 COP were called by the European media climate refugees and the Canadian media. I mean, how ridiculous, war, they were war refugees, you know? And so how easy it is to especially turn black and brown people into the bad, if not the bad migrants, the climate migrants, the naturalization of the migration process. Um, and, um, you know, so far I haven't seen Ukrainian refugees turn into climate refugees in the press yet. I hope they will not be. Um, and, um, you know, uh, and we also need to look at the differential treatment of war refugees. Why are the Syrians climate refugees and the Ukrainians are war refugees when both are war refugees and to deserve assistance? Um, I, I believe like most importantly, it, we need to strengthen the ties and solidarity between social movements because I don't think we're gonna get any change on the governmental level, frankly, at least in my country, without really uh, powerful social movements coming together and globally coming together. Um, and I know it's been a hard time with COVID and you know, distancing us, not being able to get together as much except via Zoom, um, but it's um, time to rebuild, I think, uh, global movements. And I'm thinking here of the global peace movement. I came of age um, during that movement. Um, in the 1980s, when actually the anti-nuclear movement um, um, was very important in, um, you know, uh, uh, pressuring the United States and uh, former Soviet Union into some disarmament measures. These movements have impacts. Um, I think we need also um, the, the people working on a radical reform of internet, the international financial system, which has really kind of come up these days because of the sanctions against Russia, looking at the oligarchs and kleptocrats, and you know, it's not just Russians in this case, but it's really important that we don't allow oligarchs and kleptocrats to exert so much power that they do in the world today. And that money travels easily across borders and people can't. Um, and so there really needs to be um, uh, a reform of that system or we're not going to get peace. Um, or, and we're not going to get um, positive climate policy either. Um, so again, important to remember how the global peace movement um, made such a difference. And, and many global movements have made a difference. The global climate movement has made a difference. Um, and just to, to recall that we have more power and strength than we think we do often. Um, uh, it's a difficult time right now, I would argue, and it's easy. Um, to get kind of uh, um, apocalyptic um, about, you know, we have the war in Ukraine, we have the uh, urgency of the climate crisis and, and not enough response to it, fears about the future and the rise of the far right in many countries in Europe, the United States, India. Um, so it's a fearful time and we've got to really try to steer away from that fear and understand that we can come together and be a, a, a progressive social force. Activism itself can inspire hope. And I think probably many of you know who are activists, um, it really brings you optimism to work with other people to affect change. So I just like to leave with the idea of kind of braiding our movements together, you know, climate justice, peace movement. I like, you know, your peace on climate. Um, also in the folks working for greater equity, for financial reform, for environmental justice, I mean, and feminist movements and other, other um, you know, gender movements. There are so many ways we can come together and we need to strategically come together to braid our movements together to really be a stronger force um, in this uh, very precarious uh, world at the moment. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really liked uh, this uh, uh, contribution. I think that, well, it's it's awesome what you said. And we are also, I don't know about the rest, but I feel really inspired right now. So um, now uh, I will give the floor to uh, Ms. Hendrickson to also contribute to the conversation. Thank you. Um, well, to bring us back into the less hopeful for a moment. Um, to me, it's important to interrogate 
and challenge nationalistic ideas of belonging, particularly, particularly when they endorse ideals of pure nature or a pure nation. Um, and I think critically investigating these and exposing um, what to sort of echo um, Betsy's argument in a, in a different area, critically investigating and exposing what security frames ultimately seem to protect is this is a first critical um, step in resisting them. Um, and so here far right factions have warned of an anticipated demographic great replacement as a threat to whiteness. Great replacement conspiracy theories repeat the arguments that white populations will um, will be overtaken by the mass migration of brown, black and brown peoples. And these dangerous calculations of population worth have pushed xenophobic agendas and for example it's associated with anti-muslim um, islamic phobic increased islamophobia in scandinavian countries and in the u.s uh, republican lawmakers conservative news pundits white supremacist groups um, go so far as to suggest that it's a democrat Democratic pol political conspiracy to replace real Americans with left leaning black and brown voters. Um, and at the same time, far right political parties in Europe suggest keeping out your um, immigrants to protect the European environment and such eco bordering arguments suggest that black and brown immigrants are a threat to pure nature and that anti immigrant borders are, in fact, a tool for environmental protections. And US conservative policymakers are applying the same eco fascist arguments to US border politics. Um, and here I think there's hope because there have in um, there's a growing anti eugenics movement. Um, there's out of the UK there's from small beginnings and in the US there was a dismantling eugenics conversation. And this was a cross sector cross movement conversation about the legacies of eugenics and how they've shaped our thinking about possibility and um, promise and I think that it's really the goals of those meetings were to break down these assumptions that that keep people apart through. Um, so I think there's there's hope there, and I think it's a critical frame to undercut these ideas of pure nation and and pure nature. And second, I think we need to keep challenging neo Malthusian ideas about population driven um, resource scarcity and clear space for better questions and empirically grounded assessments of adaptation priorities and realities. Um, so when the conversation is around assumptions about um, environmental doom based on too many people, there's very little future, um, there's ver it really delimits future possibilities. And I think a good example of a group that's taken on that narrative very successfully the, is the Union of Concerned Scientists. In 2021, they issued a food security and population statement um, that debunks the myth that population growth causes food insecurity by citing the true causes of hunger, like poverty, un underemployment, racism, and other social and economic inequities. And I think politicizing the roots of hunger really interrupts the notion that it is driven by too many mouths to feed. My third suggestion is to resist population control push in climate change activism and discourse. Um, a UK environmental group called Population Matters inflated a 23 foot Thai baby at COP26. Um, it's Bib said smaller families, cooler planet. And this is little political theater that to call for population control as a primary solution to climate change. And this call for population control to save the planet perpetuates the idea that size and growth are the key reasons for climate change. And as the climate uh, crisis intensifies, this dangerous and ideological drive to reduce fertility is increasingly promoted on the left and right as a climate change adaptation and, and, and mitigation strategy. And while I fully support a broad platform for sexual and reproductive health and rights, and justice. Um, this focus on fertility reduction has the potential to undermine bodily integrity uh, and human rights and 
in reproductive health policy and provision and draw focus for more effective strategies to, to address the root causes of climate change. And it is, again, an interventionist approach that aims at containing and curtailing explosive use on multiple levels. Um, and luckily, there is a robust and um, and growing reproductive justice movement, um, human rights, um, feminist approaches that really counter this. And I think that it's one of the groups that that should be part of any climate change conversation to um, make sure that the movements strengthen one another and and counter these approaches. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Hendrickson, for also giving this nuanced uh, analysis and also show us what is not that inspiring, but that we need to tackle. Uh, and well, last but not least, Dr. Sheffern, if you could tell us also the measures that you could um, encourage us to also uh, spread around. Yeah, I would like to reinforce what has been said before. To develop the positive, you have to resist the negative. Um, and uh, we are facing a um, very negative triangle of uh, economic growth, political power, and military violence. And it's escalating um, and uh, can be actually uh, leading to the end of this planet, in particular if it's uh, um, contributing to a nuclear war scenario that we are currently facing uh, in Europe. There's a lot of concern now about nuclear war. And nuclear war and nuclear weapons are actually combining growth, power, and violence in the most negative way you can imagine. It could actually, it's multiplying the, the triangle of growth, power, and violence in the most dangerous and most threatening way. And I would say we should resist the causes and not only resist the consequences in uh, the so-called resilience frameworks, which mean we all have to be resilient to all these dangers and threats. Um, I think this approach of only being resilient to the consequences of this negative triangle is the wrong approach. We need to address the causes of the problems. And uh, some of these causes have been mentioned before. And uh, how do we best address and avoid the causes of this triangle. I think we need to think about various solutions um, to move towards positive outcomes and positive ways of addressing these causes. And one of these causes now we see is climate change. Of course, we need to avoid the, the drivers of climate change, which is uh, strong economic growth and unlimited consumption production. But we also need to address the causes of violence and uh, uh, military force by peace building measures, by uh, getting rid of nuclear weapons. And uh, there have been very, of course, very important uh, suggestions on getting rid of nuclear weapons. There's uh, a ban treaty uh, that can be further developed into the abolition of nuclear weapons. So we need to build on these uh, approaches. A similar way we can build on the Paris Treaty for getting rid of the emissions uh, as drivers of these problems. So there are existing treaties and existing approaches. And there's a big force behind this. Uh, both governments support this, as well as uh, non-governmental organizations, civil society also supporting this. Um, this is uh, trying to reduce the threat. We can further develop concepts of protecting and preserving the natural resource base uh, in a sustainable way. We can build on concepts of sustainable development of welfare and adaptive capacity. We can reduce the emissions and improve, improve resource efficiency. All these concepts exist to renewable energy, to energy saving, energy efficiency. We can also build on concepts of uh, fair power distribution in the world and climate justice and law. And we have a very strong legal system uh, internationally, um, both. Uh, for nations and beyond nations, we can further develop this um, strengthening participation and cooperation and dispute resolution mechanisms. 
we can uh, um, work towards managing risk and instabilities, conflicts, multi-scale governance and environment, environmental peace building. And the last thing I think environmental peace building is a very strong and uh, powerful concept. It means that we, we need to overcome our differences and our conflicts by working together, addressing common problems, joint problems. Climate change is a common problem, okay? And uh, avoiding climate change can be a major impetus to collaborate and uh, avoid the, the differences and uh, uh, conflicts in the world in a cooperative manner. And yeah, of course it has to be done at the global level. As I said, we have the Paris Treaty, we have the Ban Treaty for nuclear weapons, but we can do, do this as, at the local scale as well between us and uh, should work uh, with each other and not against each other at all levels, at all scales. And there can be many examples other, also um, working with migrants and uh, um, people from other parts of the world. Um, some examples, for instance, they have some migrant networks in Europe. And these migrant networks keep contact to the home countries. And they have development projects in their home countries for renewable energy, for water projects. And uh, some of these projects are not known. We studied these projects, for instance, for Northwest Africa, and we found that uh, some of these migrant diaspora, so-called diaspora organizations, keep contact with their home countries and are taking part in development projects. So you see people are not the threat, not the problem. They are part of the solution. And this is what we need to work more together, um, together with civil society and governments. That's my point. They should not work against each other, but with each other. And the governments in Europe, for instance, could uh, support these diaspora projects in their home countries. And uh, so making people the links, linkages, and not dividing uh, lines and uh, not divisions across the region, but linkages and bridges between the regions across the Mediterranean, for instance. And this is uh, also something we need to study more because people are already doing this and using some of their remittances to support uh, uh, work in their home countries. Okay, and uh, yeah, more can be done, as I said, working together, building bridges across regions and across levels um, to overcome all these uh, divisions. And conflicts. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for all of you for your amazing contributions. This was uh, the official panel with the questions that we had prepared. And well, I think that well, all of us are now like way more knowledgeable about this topic. And well, especially us as peace and climate, we really wanted to have this conversation because as we tackle this issue, Sometimes we are aware that maybe we can fall into problematic narratives, something that has been said, and we obviously wouldn't want that at all. We want to contribute to the conversation. We want to improve uh, uh, the state of uh, people who have to um, migrate for different reasons, also for uh, climate reasons. But uh, I think that it, it has been a really good point, uh, especially what, Hendri what Mrs. Hendrickson said about the problematic use and also Oh, what Dr. Harman said about climate refugees. I think this is something uh, really important for us as an organization. And well, uh, before going to the final conclusions uh, that will gather everything that you have said, we wanted to give the floor for um, questions that our audience may have. We only have uh, one at the moment, but please, in the meantime, if you have other questions, like take advantage of this opportunity to ask our amazing speakers. So the first question uh, that Nathan uh, put in the chat box was, uh, how could you explain the lack of framework and international protection mechanisms for climate refugees versus existing ones for traditional refugees defined by the Geneva Convention? Um, I don't know exactly, Nathan, if you want to uh, clarify anything else or if you want to tell us for who exactly is this question, if it's for everyone or whoever wants to respond. If not, uh, oh, 
it's for everyone so okay. whoever wants to take yeah it if um, someone wants to start <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm happy to say something, but I'm sure the others will as well. But um, um, I mean, this is a tricky question because um, again, when you talk about climate refugees, it um, makes people, you know, that was climate that made them migrate. Uh, now in some situations that may be true, but in many, like we're looking at the complex reasons and why do people migrate across borders? And I'm, I'm really, I have a hard time with the climate refugee discourse. Um, uh, and for example, it was used um, in the United States several years ago when um, there was the caravan from Central America. Um, there were many progressive people who said, these are climate refugees. We should have a special kind of dispensation to let them over the border because there was drought in Honduras. Well, there's also a drug war in Honduras. People, the government has not done anything to help people with the drought. People are being um, displaced for a multitude of reasons and violence being political violence and, and drug violence being uh, among the top and climate plays a role. So to call these people climate refugees, the problem is that US immigration policy at the border is so terrible. And, it's, and of course it got, it got worse under Obama and then even worse under Trump and it's still bad. So the pro for me, it's not so much that we need a separate climate refugee. Again, I don't like the term. We might um, want to include climate-related migration as into the factors why people are migrating. But I think we need to have basically a move forward in the future toward a, a open, more open borders and for um, immigrant and refugee rights at the border and for the ability to claim asylum. Um, so for me to put it in this, uh, the kind of climate refugee framework actually narrows what we, we need. Um, um, we need to rethink border policy and we need to demilitarize borders. Um, so that would, be, that would be my suggestion here, but it's a, it's a good question and a hard one. Yeah. Shall I comment on this? Okay. Um, I think the term refugee is, is, is defined already by the Geneva Convention. And uh, because people cannot live anymore in a country because uh, um, the government is against these people. They have to leave. They cannot live anymore in this country. They risk their life in the country for whatever reason. and. Uh, people affected by climate change are in a different category. In principle, they could live in the country still um, because they're not persecuted by the government. And uh, the term was invented to give more weight to the climate change, okay? They say climate change can lead to violent conflict, climate change can lead to refugee movement. For that reason, climate change is a, um, extremely important subject. It's, it's a kind of attempt to securitize climate change. Um, for that reason, we are, since then, since the mid 1990s, people have been talking about climate war and climate refugees to give more weight to climate change. I think this is no longer necessary. Climate change it's itself is already a major problem for this planet, independent of whether you call it climate war or climate refugees. Okay, and uh, of course, people who are suffering from climate change and have to leave the country need to be protected. They need help even before they have to leave the country. And independent of whether you call it climate war or climate refugees, because simply the rich countries are the drivers of climate change. And it's already a problem independent of all these naming and blaming shaming games of uh, climate change. Anyway, I want to say we have to avoid climate change and we have to avoid violence and war, independent of what the consequences are. And this is, uh, this is the main challenge. Um, I, I don't mind. Uh, I'm, I'm, it's fine for me if people get asylum. 
if they try to escape from the consequences of climate change. And uh, if the rich countries give them a, a certain, okay, this is okay, but it's better to avoid the problem in the countries before the problems become so bad that the people have to move before, not after. So this is our challenge to act preventively and not when the disaster is already striking. Uh, thank you uh, for this. Uh, I think that it's a very good question. Thank you, Nathan, for raising the question, because even though the term is problematic, uh, as we have discussed, it's also very important to see how we can do, we can give these people a legal resource when actually climate change is not contemplated in the Geneva Convention and people who are directly or indirectly fleeing their country for something related uh, in some way to, to climate change, they cannot, they don't have this legal resource to seek asylum. So um, I think it's really important to, to see how can we fight the narrative of climate refugee, but still at the same time give uh, relief to these people who actually are affected in some way by it. I don't know if um, Mrs. Hendrickson, you had anything to add uh, to this uh, question. Well, in relation to to um, your comment, I think that it's not just a question of how we categorize. It's it's an opportunity to perhaps um, rethink all of these categories altogether. <laughs> and I think that um, that the the danger lies in trying to qualify particular circumstances and rate the the um, worthiness of of, um, of refugees and and to me it relates to so many other questions of rights continuums where you know you don't want to parse out um, whose situation is the most w worthy of support so I think that um, in general it's an opportunity to particularly as um, anti-immigration sentiment rises, perhaps it's time for an entirely new strategy. So um, I'm not um, suggesting that that law can't be a powerful tool, but you know, just sort of thinking it from, um, from a more fundamental standpoint. Thank you. So if uh, oops, oops, we have we a have question. A, yeah. Should so I read yeah, you can read it, you can okay. read it. So um, Maya asks, if by 2030, the global efforts on tackling the, challenge, the challenges of climate change fail to achieve the needed goals, do we have a protection of the scope and scale of human migration due to climate change by then? Okay, so I think, um, uh, okay, so if we, if we haven't managed by 2030 to tackle the challenges that climate change is posing, um, do we have a projection? Can we foresee how the scope and scale of human migration will be due to climate change or amplified by climate change? Um, should, I, should I say something? Um, well, I, I really hope we don't get to that point, but we, we may. <laughs> but um, I think it's very hard to judge the extent of migration, even as climate change gets worse, um, especially across international borders. Again, most of the research suggests um, most climate migration, related migration will be um, within national borders, but of course that could change and it, it may be affected as things get worse. Um, and also so much depends on, you know, as Jürgen was saying, what uh, company, uh, countries do um, to um, prevent um, you know, to protect people so that they don't have to move or they only have to move temporarily. I mean, there's a lot of temporary migration already happening with climate related disasters, for example, even in the United States and people migrate temporarily and then go back. So, um, and there are ways to manage that and to assist that, um, that, that are possible. So I think we need to guard against against, um, you know, that, that uh, UK report I was telling you about, they, they looked at the numbers, you know, in, in, in this period where these climate refugee, climate war things were really being bandied about, um, you know, there were these incredible 
people would say, oh, they're going to be, you know, millions of climate refugees by this year or, um, or, or, or whatever. And there were these, you know, um, I think UNEP put out a figure, the World Bank put up uh, out a figure. And they were, um, you know, when you look at how those figures were produced, and the same thing happened around environmental refugees, by the way, and I know people who are involved in producing those figures and say it was really very unscientific. So, um, and the UK reports that these numbers are very unscientific. They're not rooted in fact, um, or they're not rooted in, in evidence or good forecasting. So we need to really steer away from making claims of you know, millions of climate refugees if climate change is not mitigated by 2030, um, which isn't to say there might not be more um, climate-related migration. But let's stay away from kind of the, um, there needs to be more evidence-based research and forecasting. And, you know, one cannot underestimate the power of such grandiose numbers used by international agencies, used by NGOs, used by certain scholars to gain attention, okay? You cannot under, underestimate it. So we all need to be a bit skeptical of, um, and we really need to look at, okay, what research is this based on? And um, just as an example, a couple of years ago, the New York Times Magazine did a big story on climate refugees. And it was based on some huge computer setup, you know, putting all, you know, kind of like limits to growth back, back when, putting in all this data just to show how bad things were going to get. And it was just a very, um, a very depressing article and also very racialized with pictures of work. Um, people of color mainly um, in Africa and also in Central America and so kind of building fear and you know that is a strategy um, and some people might think oh we're doing it for good reasons because we want to get you know the U.S. government or Republicans interested in climate change but it's not the right way to go building fear is not the way right way to go uh, doing bad um, you know um, pseudoscientific research is not the way to go. We need really good research. And um, I also think just in, across academic disciplines too, for example, anthropologists have looked a lot at kind of cooperation and conflict between herders and um, farmers in parts of Africa, you know, and, you know, uh, looking very carefully at what causes conflict, what doesn't. And, and actually sometimes when there's drought, there's greater cooperation, not more conflict. So we need to look at those case studies. Anthropologists need to be talking to climate scientists. And I think it's happening more and more. And geographers, I mean, there just needs to be a lot more, um, uh, I think, um, work across disciplines to, um, to, to, to give us evidence evidence-based, um, you know, work that then you can base policy on and not these kind of grandiose claims. Can I comment on this? Of course. Sure. Um, yeah, the problem is that we may be actually moving into a disaster world, but not because of migration, but because of uh, the, the end games of a globalized fossil nuclear capitalism. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, one consequence is climate change, one consequence is violent conflict, and one conflict con consequence is uh, forced displacement or refugee movements. But of, because of all the different disaster developments together may lead to forced displacement. And um, I, I wouldn't say climate change is the main driver, driver of, of migration, but this disaster world that's created by, as I say, fossil nuclear capitalism and the end games of it. And this all together is the problem and not the migration, not the consequences are the problem, but the causes are the problem. Thank you very much. That's very, very insightful. <laughs> So we wanted to ask you, if you don't mind staying maybe 10 minutes over time, we have another question that we think is worth um, answering if you, the speakers don't mind. Um, should I read it? Um, sure. So Johanna asks, uh, which implication do, you, uh, do your analysis have for the development 
uh, or foreign policies of the EU towards southern Mediterranean countries. Um, so yeah, EU policy, de development and foreign policy towards uh, southern European countries, what, mm, what is the political implication of this? Um, I don't know if um, maybe you, Dr. Sheffron, I think you're a European, maybe you know more about EU policy, but that, yeah, I don't whoever, know, anyone yeah. who, wants, who wants to take over. Um, is this a question to me? No, to, to anyone, to okay. anyone who wants to answer. Well, <laughs> if I can give a short comment, um, of course, there's always an alternative world, okay? I, the world is not determined. The future is not necessarily disastrous, okay? It's always a change is possible. And sometimes the experience of disasters and wars can lead to opposite reactions. The uh, kind of shock therapy, where we see, uh, we were kind of in a shock situation now with the, with the war on Ukraine in Ukraine, um, it's possible that the, the forces towards uh, avoiding the problems um, yeah, can, can prevail. Uh, like we had after World War II, there was kind of shock. Of course, there was a uh, Cold War coming after that, but for at least for, for a moment, there was a chance for the better. And after each shock and after each disaster, there is a chance for the better. And the chance for the better can mean uh, the, 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 the understanding and the, the lesson that we have to do better to avoid more shocks like this. And uh, there is, of course, a chance for collaboration across the Mediterranean between European Union, Northern Africa, and uh, the Middle Eastern countries. Um, the Mediterranean is, of course, a very important critical region uh, for collaboration. And there is a lot of collaboration opportunities if you only think about the huge amount of renewable energy, a solar energy that's available in the soil in the, in the Mediterranean region, and this is a, a big opportunity to move away from the fossil and the nuclear age into a new age of solar, solar power. And the Mediterranean is one example, but many other regions as well have a lot of solar energy that can be used for peaceful and uh, sustainable development. I'd just like to add to that too. I mean, it just seems like such an important moment now, you know, when we saw the nuclear power plants in Ukraine being under attack, right? It seems like a really um, good moment to abandon nuclear power as, um, you know, a, a form of renewable energy that's going to get us out of the climate crisis. And, you know, I like Jurgen's talk about, uh, you know, fossil fuel nuclear capitalism. And I think, um, you know, renewable energies and also, um, you know, uh, diversifying the grid and um, having more local control of the grid. Um, they're, all, you know, renewable, the, the, the European Union, I know very little about, you know, the, the politics of that region and, and the EU, but, but it seems so important to make this transition to renewable energy. And that's going to be you know, and that's not simple either, because there's a political economy of where you put the industrial solar fields and, you know, and, and, and the, who makes the investments, who gets the profits from the investment. Um, there's also, as we uh, wean ourselves from fossil fuels and the price of fossil fuels goes up, if they're carbon um, uh, taxes or um, uh, then who's going to benefit from those kinds of changes. And there are ways, for example, through carbon dividends to the population, there are ways to offset for poor folks um, the rising cost of carbon. And, to, and also that can be used to, to finance, um, finance renewable energy um, rather than go into the pockets of the fossil fuel companies themselves. So I think people are gonna have to get super literate in climate policy. Um, and you know, in renewables, because hopefully that is the way of the future, but that's not gonna be without its own conflicts and without its own inequalities. And so um, that's another, I think, very fertile area for um, research and for people coming together politically to look at how to manage that energy transition in a way that improves equity rather than uh, um, in, increases um, 
inequality. Okay, well, thank you so much for everyone, especially also to the audience for raising these very interesting questions. Unfortunately, as I said in the chat, we don't have much time, but you uh, feel free to, to reach out in our social media. Also feel free to also to get more knowledge about it, uh, read the work that our speakers have done about it. So, uh, well, you have their names also in our social media, then uh, know more about our speakers if you weren't here at the beginning, so you can read their work. And well, I just wanted to summarize some of the key points that have been made through this conference, but I think that we'll also publish something in our website because in a few words, I cannot make justice to, to what has been said. So I think one of the most important takeaways is to try to avoid uh, simplistic approaches and generalizing approaches uh, to, the, to the narrative of climate-induced uh, migration. We have to avoid problematic narratives. And also we have to avoid fear narratives uh, because they are not the good way to go. They put um, some people as a threat instead of being actually the victims. And uh, we also should uh, take advantage of the situation and to see the, the opportunities that this uh, bad situation has. But we can also, instead of focusing on the um, climate-induced uh, migration security threat narrative, we can also look at green peace building and environmental peace building uh, as a, the opportunity of this bad situation and how this can foster more uh, investment on, this, on civil society, on local engagement, on uh, social movements. And um, what else am I missing? Okay, we also uh, need to look at the broader picture and see what has caused this situation. We have to look at the broader structure of this fossil nuclear capitalism and this shock uh, doctrine uh, system that we are living in. We also have to think about the, the whole migration system and the border system itself. Uh, when we talk about climate refugees, we have to question the whole refugee system itself and how it put privileges on people's suffering. And yeah, I think uh, this was uh, this, these were the main uh, points that were raised. We are very happy to to have you here. And well, um, yeah, I think yeah. that's all. I I, think, I, yeah. yeah, if I can just add, like I think it was really like what was really inspiring for me was to see how um, like we, we touched upon so many different things today. We went from energy to international law to uh, demographics and population control. And this like this very, very wide spectrum of uh, topics that were covered just starting from migration and climate change. I think it gives us really an idea of how interconnected all of these topics are. And even though it's very important, of course, to, um, to, spe to specialize and to to lead local action, I think it also let us, uh, lets us understand how holistic and how you know really universal and structural the problems that we have talked about today are, and how you know mm, trying to solve one is actually very much putting on uh, putting us on the right way on the right path to solving many other problems. So I think this was really inspiring for me to to see and. Um, every time I have a confirmation of this, I, I'm very, I'm very inspired and I'm very motivated too. Yeah, and last thing yeah. I wanted to say is that this is just one of the series of conferences that we are gonna uh, do leading to COP twenty seven, but obviously beyond that, and we are gonna keep these recommendations that our amazing speakers have done because we will obviously try to write something for policymakers to question uh, this entire question. So stay tuned in our social media because we will have more debates on all the topics. I think the next one will be about uh, water. Um, how it affects also uh, people, how it affects peace, but we'll have many others. So if you want to recommend also feel free. Mm -hmm. And well, again, thanks to our speakers for being here. We hope that, well, you have a nice evening and well, a nice week. And yeah, we're very glad that you're here. And yeah, that was all. So thank you so much also for the audience for coming here today. And yeah. Yeah, That's thank all. you very much. Thank yeah. you so much. That was thank, really thank you. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Sure. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.
Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.